I think post fizz is the time when I want to be wowed by how it fits into the shot when you're working into real plates. It fills in the blanks. There, I think it's invaluable. The traditional boundaries, not only of department, are shifting, but of chronology are shifting. Now you're sometimes cutting things before you're shooting them. The previous process doesn't have to stop after principal photography wraps. It really is the time in which the exploration should continue to craft your movie. Postfiz gives you the ability to accurately present your vision so that people could creatively be on board with you. Uh, it's much more efficient time-wise because the director's time is very valuable in post-production. You're doing a million things, working on the Iron Man movies, Cowboys and Aliens, Iron Man where sometimes it's just an empty plate, Cowboys and Aliens where you have horses and guys on horseback fighting aliens. It helped me conceive it, but, but what it really helps with is the editorial process. Post-Fizz gets in there, and they're the first ones in that really dial in where these things are going to be. By the time I saw the movie for the first time, there was some very passable animation, so I could actually see what was going on, and more importantly, my editors could cut it together. Post-Fizz gives you the insight to do it. They didn't have to imagine what might be there. Iron Man would be an example where the main character is computer generated. So there's no movie to watch unless Iron Man's put in there. The background plates are empty. There's no story being told. There's no way to cut the film. There's no way to figure out the shot count for the VFX vendor. There's no way to know what the character's supposed to be doing in each shot. So the Post-Fizz really fills those gaps and builds a roadmap for creating the final character. One of the most spectacular visual effects in Iron Man is the suit-up sequence that happens when Tony Stark gets into the Iron Man suit right before the fight in Golmera. What most people don't realize about that sequence was that wasn't originally in the film. As they were working in post, and as they were getting more excited about the film, John Favreau and Marvel sort of got together and said, you know, we're missing something here. We need to show the audience how does he get the suit on? Like, how does this happen? And that pre viz process that ended up into a post viz process, and that ended up driving the reshoot which in which we used to stand an actor for most of the full body shots and then brought Robert Downey Jr. in whose time is extremely valuable just for the, sort of the hero end shots where you see his, his face and you see him getting in the suit. So it was an amazing collaboration of, of multiple departments to sort of get that together and to sort of create a, a, ultimately a sequence that's probably one of the most memorable visual effects sequences in the entire film. Post-vis meaning post-principal photography is a way that you can take the plates and begin the process of visual effects, adding in the elements that are missing that they were not able to film on set. Sometimes that's adding in creatures, sometimes that's adding in explosions, sometimes that's adding in extra characters, sometimes it's combining multiple plates to form a larger shot. The final visual effects pipeline is that it can take days or hundreds and hundreds of supercomputers hours and hours to render these shots. Well, that's very expensive too, so let's not do that while we're trying to figure out what should be there in the green screen. I guess you need some arbitrary jumping off point because it's always about money, right? How much money you spend planning, how much money you spend on previs, on the actual shot, on what's going to hit the screen. Because at the end of the day, previs is seen by studios as something that's never in the movie. It's like the mold that you break to reveal 
the sculpture. So why spend a lot of money on what the mold looks like? Well, you know, the artist would say, well, the casting of what's inside is going to be directly affected by how much time you spend with the mold. It's like a temp score. So how much are you going to spend on a music editor? Well, I think a music editor is going to help you find your score. And so the score is going to be better and more efficiently done, and you're not going to have to redo it. I've never thrown out a score because I've planned my score with my music editor and understand what the music has to do in the movie. By the time we actually score it, you have an orchestra, you know what you're going to do. Same thing with effects. And sometimes you're still bidding in post-production, by the way. Those days of going to one house and they do everything is done. It's just too expensive. And sometimes you split the work off and go to different houses for different specialties. You know, it's also a manpower issue. You know, some houses are great at animation. You're not going to have them painting wires out. Some people are great working with fire or doing design work or doing all the gadgets from Iron Man. You know, there are small houses that did amazing jobs that I wouldn't necessarily have hired to do the whole movie. And so you're creating bidding packages. When you have post-vis and a cut, they know exactly how many people they have to hire, how much time it's going to take, how much they're going to charge you. And just like anything else, just like bidding work on a house, if you say, yeah, fix my house up, you don't know what that means. But if you say, I need this wall painted and I need to replace these windows, they can give you a much more specific price. Something interesting that's happening now is that the cost of live action shooting and the cost of effects houses doing final work are both very, very pricey and are kind of almost becoming the same. Where time and money are so precious, we need to make sure that they are both as efficient as possible and are creatively serving the director. In the live action paradigm, it's pre so that when we are on set, that very, very valuable set time is utilized as much as it can be, and we get as many creative variations and as good of a performance from the actor as we can, rather than spending time trying to solve technical issues. If you were to take a director and say, look, there's this big scene we want to shoot in Times Square. We want three helicopters, we want a thousand extras, we want 50 cabs, we want uh, two cars to crash into each other, and you shoot it, and I want to shoot with eight cameras. If it was necessary to the story, everybody would say, fantastic, and you go and shoot it. It's a million dollar day. Now, if a director were to go into the dailies the next day and say, watch this in front of a studio executive and say, oh, you know, that cab down there didn't quite hit its marks and those three extras over there, I wanted them to be back. Let's reshoot the sequence. He would be fired immediately or everybody would think he's completely nuts. But you can have 50 or 60 people working on a complex visual effects shot that maybe is five or six seconds long and a director will watch it in a room on a loop where it goes over and over and over. Well, after 10 or 15, times he's seen it, of course you're going to start to see the faults in it. And then he'll say, well, you know, I want to move those extras and I want to change that car and I want to change the color of that car. And, you, and then he forgets that, because he's only talking to the visual effects supervisor, that there's probably another 50 people who make exactly the same amount of money, if not more, than the people that were shooting the film. And they'll spend five or six days instead of one day working to make these changes. And then they wonder why everything costs so much. If a studio or a visual effects studio receives a post vis edit, it's extremely clear what they're bidding on. They know exactly the plates and where the visual effects are ultimately going to go, what needs to be tracked, what needs to be composited, what needs to be simulated, what needs to be animated. All of the kind of traditional questions that VFX studios need to answer, it's right there in black and white. Your post vis guy's right there with you, he's down the hall usually. That way you're not waiting for all these animators and passes and things from your vendor. Because those are just man hours, it just starts jacking the price up. You're better off with a much more nimble group of people that get your sensibility. All of what we do involves a certain amount of exploration. If you want the stuff to look good, you know, then maybe you should need to talk to the guy who's going to shoot it early. Maybe you need to talk to the guy who's going to design the sets early. How about the cutter? Editors have an important role in post, but if they can be involved early, you'll get the benefit of that perspective. What if the editor can be involved even before the shooting happens? Oh wait, he can because we're pre it. 
we don't want to send something to a final visual effects house and then it's not working in the cut. It's not working with the flow of the story because that's a lot of time, money, render time, and resources that went into that. What I've been doing personally in PostViz quite a lot is doing the rough track and doing the rough comp, um, giving it to the editors. They can slice and dice that around and see what's working and what's not working. But the most valuable thing is that we can show to the visual effects vendor Here's a quick time that is low resolution and not amazing rendering, but it is exactly what the director wants, and it fits into the edit perfectly. PostViz is hugely powerful. Instead of being grounded in the reality of what you think the set's going to be like, now you're grounded in the reality of what's actually in camera. So you're further along the road, but you've got a long way to go, so you just revisit it. It serves as a previs for the visual effects that are coming, but at the same time, now you've got something based on the footage that's going to be inside the cut. Even its preliminary versions, you have a cut that plays. At the same time that you're, in effect, coming up with a plan for what you're going to do further down the line, you have a placeholder that's going to be able to communicate how the shot's going to work in the, in the whole sequence. When we first got the Droid Factory sequence, it was literally video of actors jumping on a blue treadmill. We knew what their actions were, and we knew where George wanted to take the sequence, but that was really about it. It really came down on us to take the concept designs from the art department of what the Droid Factory would look like, build those assets, track the plates, and then introduce those digital elements and animate them so that it all came together and actually made sense. It also needed to serve as a very solid marker for ILM for the visual effects work because George didn't want to leave anything for chance. He wanted to be able to define what he needed in the sequence up front and deliver a very complete design doc in the form of a quick time movie so that the visual effects company knew exactly what they were going to be doing. If a VFX vendor has to send quick times back and forth on the FTP server and communicate with emails, that is going to slow down the communication process and ultimately be more out of pocket expenses for the VFX vendor. It brings about a sense of stress and I'm not sure what shot to do. More importantly though, it lowers the quality of the final product because you probably had to wait until the last minute to get the answers that you wanted, hence it's midnight and you're rendering and you're freaking out and you get something that's kind of just above par but not really the magic that you could have given to it if you were given the time to do it properly. Do that with us first so the VFX vendor can do what they are experts at which is finally the footage and just making it magic. Well, if you have a good post guy they can also help interface with the effects house as they turn over the information and as the software becomes better, you could actually transfer assets over, so you might even be building off of animation that was done by your PostFiz guy. So again, the line's disappearing. Another place where the PostFiz process was key in Iron Man was in the heads-up display or HUD devices. The HUDs were one of the most highly conceptual aspects of the film, and so it ended up being a, a really difficult problem to solve. Like, what do the HUDs look like? What the PostFiz process allowed us to do is we could take Robert Downey Jr.'s plates and insert temporary versions of the HUD effects one, to ease everyone's concern about how experimental those shots were, and two, to sort of give the orphanage a good idea of where we wanted to go with this. And it actually allowed them to design on top of what the crew designs that we would come up with. It was a very easy way since we were at the production to try ideas and show them to John Nelson, to show them to John Favreau and to see, hey, does this seem to be going in the right direction? This is a cliche, but it bears repeating. We don't do individual shots. We're not shot makers, we're storytellers. You know, if, if, if the thing doesn't work in, in, in the context of a sequence, it's not going to work. If you are able to take something a little bit further, you're able to get the information that the director wants to convey to the final effects vendor. And that becomes something that's more of a blueprint of inspiration, if you will. It's not so much fill in the blank as much as here, make it like this, but make it even better.